All right, hi everyone. Welcome to this Shut Em Out in Trivia event with J. Scott Savage. I'm Callie Hansen. I am uh, part of the marketing team for Shadow Mountain and I will be hosting here with uh, author J. Scott Savage today. Um, before we get started, I just want to introduce our author and um, a little bit of the books that he's written. So, J. Scott Savage is the author of 19 published novels, including The Lost Wonderland Diaries, which you can see here, and um, the Mysteries of Cove series, uh, the Case File series, and the Far World series. As you can see there, they're all exciting stories. Um, his books have received stars, starred reviews from Publishers Weekly and Kirkus. He's been named a Junior Library Guild selection and Amazon Book of the Month and a Barnes and Noble Select Book and won several awards. So without further ado, let's pass the torch on to J. Scott Savage and he will lead us along in some Wonderland trivia. Hey everybody, how are you doing? So I'm excited to be here. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Alice in Wonderland. We're going to talk about Lewis Carroll. Um, but I thought I'd start with giving you a little background about me, my books, and, and kind of the big question, which is why write uh, an Alice in Wonderland uh, spinoff? So we'll jump right in here. And uh, like Callie mentioned, um, I've written 19 novels. Uh, the Far World series was my first middle grade fantasy series. And that was kind of uh, jumping into this, this world of, of I have a boy in a wheelchair and a girl who lives in a world where everyone has magic, but magic doesn't work on her charms, potions, spells, they all bounce off of her and they've got to figure out how to open a doorway between their two worlds. And then the Case File 13 series, uh, Zombie Kid was actually named a Summer Scares read this year, which was great. That's uh, kind of my my younger, you know, kids who love monsters. Halloween's their favorite holiday. And and I, I sort of like my series to have a different feel. Like, I want you to know that it's a, a J. Scott Savage novel, but not necessarily feel like the same kind of story. Uh, so Mysteries of Cove is a steampunk dragon series uh, that came my wife and I went to go see a musical called Wicked and before the curtains opened up above the theater we see this giant mechanical dragon and I'm like okay I totally want to write a story about kids building a mechanical dragon and that became the Mysteries of Cove series and then my newest book is uh, The Lost Wonderland Diaries and so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how that came about so this is me when I was, I think, 10 or 11 years old. Now that is a school picture. It's kind of funny. I don't know the school pictures look like that anymore, but that was a, a school picture, but that's not what I look like most of the time. Uh, most of the time I looked a lot more like the kid on the left there. Um, and one of the things that I, I sort of like to focus on in my stories is kids who might not initially fit in, kids who are discovering that their differences are really great things for them. Um, and as a kid, I had uh, one eye that was uh, weaker than the other eye. And so I had a patch over one eye and glasses. And I'd tell everyone uh, I was a pirate. Um, I was in speech therapy because I had problems pronouncing certain words. And so uh, I spent a lot of time really kind of working on, on my speech. Um, and then I also, had a hard time focusing. I would I would kind of daydream a lot and you know I'd be kind of having movies going on in my head and my teachers would be like uh, are you paying attention and I'd be like what and then I'd actually have to do my work and everything um, and so I like to write stories about kids who have differences and how those differences uh, fit in. So I guess the first question to ask is why another Wonderland retelling? Like there are so many great books. Um, Wonderland in and of itself is this amazing world and and it, it just has these cool creatures and these great quotes and everything like that. And so there are a lot of people that have written retellings of Wonderland. Um, there's the Looking Glass Wars, there's Heartless, um, just tons and tons of, of books. Um, and so for me, I read all those and loved them. But for me, Alice in Wonderland itself has always been the book that sort of clicked for me. And so when I started with the Lost Wonderland Diaries, the concept came from the idea of 
what if Wonderland was a real place? And what if kids went in there? I, I want to write um, not a, a change or a spinoff. I want to focus on Wonderland, but have kids today go into Wonderland. Um, and, and Wonderland has always been, for me, my favorite book. Like, like it's terrible to ask an author, what is your favorite book? It's like asking a parent, like, who's your favorite kid? Even if you know, you're not going to tell them, right? Um, but I think the thing that I love about the Alice in Wonderland books is that you have to start with Lewis Carroll. And a lot of people know Lewis Carroll um, as, a, as a poet, as this incredibly imaginative person who loved wordplay and puzzles. He invented words like, like chortle and galumph that, that are used all the time now, but he actually made those words. Um, I think other than the Bible and Shakespeare that Alice in Wonderland is the most quoted book in the entire world. It's like, I think, top 10 in international translations. It's just this incredibly uh, imaginative and complex, uh, fun world. But what a lot of people don't know is that that was only one side of Lewis Carroll. His real name, he wrote under Lewis Carroll, but his real name was Charles Dodson. And he was a math professor, uh, an inventor, a photographer. He published multiple math books. In fact, one of my favorite stories is that uh, after Alice in Wonderland came on, the queen emailed him. And I believe that she was the only fan mail he ever responded to. And she said, are you gonna write any more books? And so he sent her one of his math books. Um, but Charles Dodson was a math professor. He invented um, all kinds of things. Um, he invented what's called the nictograph, which was a little device that he used to take notes at night, sort of like a braille type format, but a little device with these squares that he put dots in so that he could take notes and write at night without having to burn candles. He was a photographer. Uh, he designed an early version of Scrabble. Um, he invented something called word ladders. Uh, math knots, just all kinds of stuff. And so what you basically have is you have this really intriguing combination of logic and imagination. Um, and people know the weird, but a lot of times they don't see the logic underneath. And there's so much math, there's so much science that's underneath this silly, funny story. And even his poems, the way that they're set up um, are really cool. And so as I studied Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodson, I read about the fact that he kept diaries his whole life. And after he died, four of his diaries disappeared. No one knows who took them, what happened to them, what was in them. And like as an author, that's your kind of big what if moment, you know, what's in those stories? And what if they were this? And what if Charles Dodson, the mathematician, was actually studying how to open a dimension to another world, you know, a, a doorway to another dimension? And, and what if Wonderland was a real place? And he visited it and then came back and went, wait, as Charles Dodson, the mathematician, I can't tell this story. So I will tell it as Lewis Carroll, the fantasy writer. Right. OK, so that's my imagination. That's where kind of things go. And I thought, well, surely somebody has like written like novels about what are in the diaries. And when they hadn't, that was kind of the click for me. And it was like, oh, OK, this is a story that I totally need to write. Um, so I started with two characters. For me, I, I always like to like look at the world I'm writing in and then look at the conflict between the world and the characters. So when I wrote Mysteries of Cope, for example, um, the world was sort of a uh, city of ember type place, um, but with creativity banned, right? So there's a steampunk feel to it. There's a lack of creativity. So what I want is I want a kid who is an inventor and who is creative because that comes up with the conflict. And so I came up with two, two kids, Celia and Tyrus, who are both great mechanics and inventor, um, now that's Celia and Tyrus is here. That was, um, ooh, who was that? Callista and Trenton, um, who were in Mysteries of Cove. Um, so with Wonderland, because I loved that logic and imagination and the conflict inherent in the story there, I started with a girl named Celia. And Celia is dyslexic. And so I really had to study neurodiversity and what that means. And not just, oh, it's a little bit hard to read, but how dyslexia, how being neurodiverse completely changes 
a child's life and how that affects them literally for their entire life. And so Celia does not like books. She has never liked reading because for her, it's not even that reading is hard, it's that reading makes her feel different. What she's really good at is logic and math and puzzles. And for her, that's her focus. That's kind of her go-to. That's how she sort of stays below the radar, radar which is her whole, her whole goal at this new school is to not be noticed. Well, her mother is a librarian. And so she's in the library with her mother when she meets Tyrus. And Tyrus is the ultimate book nerd. When I was a kid, I got picked on a lot being different. And the library was the place that I went to and stories were my escape. And that's Tyrus. Tyrus carries a backpack that is filled with books. Early on, Celia discovers him in the library, what appears to be stealing books. And when she catches up with him and realizes what he's doing, she actually discovers that what he's doing is not stealing books, but reshelving books, okay? So he is the ultimate book nerd. He loves imagination. And the two of them discover Lewis Carroll's missing diaries because Celia is the great, 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 great grandniece of Lewis Carroll. They discover the missing diaries. They figure out the code they're written in. They solve the code and inadvertently open a doorway to Wonderland. And when they do, they discover that the creatures that we know and love are there. There's, you know, Hatter and White Rabbit and Cheshire and, and a lot of these other characters, Dormouse and Duchess. But something has escaped in Wonderland, this monstrosity, and it's changing the creatures we know and love. So the Cheshire Cat has a robot body and the White Rabbit, who's this cute little bunny with a pocket watch, is now this like psychotic clock collector with fangs. And, and so they want to figure out what's going on in Wonderland. And Tyrus is like, this is the coolest thing ever. And Celia's like, I hate this. I just want to get out and go home. This isn't logical. This doesn't make sense. And so they have the help of a new character that I added, Sylvan Rabbit, who is the great, 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 great granddaughter of White Rabbit. And so Sylvan takes them to meet the March Hare or the Mad Hatter but the Mad Hatter can't help them because he has been trapped by the evil Queen of Hearts who wants them to help open this box without a key that contains all of the power in Wonderland. Now, my publisher made what's called a book trailer, kind of like a movie trailer for books. This was uh, Shadow Mountain's first animated trailer and we had so much fun making this. So, um, Callie, could you go ahead and share that with everyone? Is it time? Is it time? Is it time? Pour the crumpets, butter the tea. The fraptious hour is at hand. Blow the horn to summon the three. Danger stalks through Wonderland. A puzzle hidden long ago. Four books to send you on your quest. Our world is not the one you know. A raven or a writing desk. Flee the queen whose heart is stone. Find the box without the key. Claim its power as your own. Beware the vile hauntstrosity. Celia and Tyrus. Wonderland is in grave danger. We desperately seek two brave children who can stop the darkness that is attacking our world and keep it from escaping to your own. But beware, Wonderland is not as you know it. The beloved creatures are being turned into... Please, hurry. You'll find me at the tea party going quite mad. All right. Thanks, Callie. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, so just a couple more things about kind of how I viewed and, and researched and sort of studied Wonderland. Um, and then we'll jump into our trivia and do some giveaways and everything. So um, one of the things about Lewis Carroll, as well as, as being both this inventor, mathematician and, and creative genius, is he was really an innovator. Um, we don't think now that having a young girl be a narrator for her story is, is really groundbreaking. But at the time, this was incredibly groundbreaking. Um, you could have a, a, a girl in a story, but she would never be the narrator of this story. 
And so in this case, having Alice tell the story and, and her whole interaction, her whole kind of coming of age thing and everything like that, um, just was amazing. It was really groundbreaking. And I really believe that Lewis Carroll opened the door for what we view as sort of that, that middle grade tween YA, that whole genre, he opened that up. That was that was early middle grade, early YA. And so when um, I wrote my story, uh, I started with Celia and Tyrus. And again, like I said, it, it, there was a lot of research in understanding neurodiversity and really trying to get that right. Because this is one of those things where, where it's like, I'd rather not even have a neurodiverse character than in any way uh, offend people or 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 not get it right. In fact, one of the stories that I really loved was that I I researched people, I'd read, I'd gotten lots of beta reader feedback, and we had our our arcs go out that were were out the early reader copies, and I had a reading specialist who gave it a really bad review and said, uh, I stopped like 50 pages in, I'm not gonna recommend this to librarians. And I like, like I never respond to, to reviewers, right? Because readers, you can love something or not love it. Like that, that's up to you, right? That is your interpretation. But I wanted to make sure I got this right. And so I, I messaged her and I said, hey, you don't have to respond to me at all, but if there's something that I got wrong, I can still fix it before it goes to the publisher. And she told me what her concern was. And it was a valid concern, even though it was something that my dyslexic readers had said, yeah, that works. From an instructor standpoint, it was an issue. And so we fixed it and got that right. And, and she wrote just this really nice letter and column saying how much she appreciated that. And for me, that's what I wanted to do. So I wanted to have a, a narrator, like I love Percy Jackson being dyslexic, right? But with Percy Jackson, basically, it's just there's a few things that are hard to read. And that's not the case. When I interviewed neurodiverse people and really talked to them, and they're like, look, this is who I am. These are the things that I dealt with. This is what I deal with now. This is me kind of looking back and still struggling with some of these things. So I started with a dyslexic girl. And then having her mother be a librarian puts a really nice conflict in there where we can see this kind of love. I, most of my readers are like either like, yeah, I'm totally Tyrus, I'm the book nerd, or I'm the person who didn't like reading when I was younger and didn't feel like I fit in. Um, and so then we tie them together with puzzles and problem solving, balancing that logic and imagination. And I think that especially with what we're dealing right now with COVID and, and politics, all the other things that we've had going on, that there really is this balance of, of science and the hard things that we have to do. And then that imagination, those stories that we still wanna tell, the stories that we escape into. One of the things I read recently is that a lot of people when they're stressed out, they'll reread stories that they love or watch movies that they love because they know how it ends, right? And it's like, okay, this is stressful, but it clicks. And so that's sort of something that I wanted to put together and that I really felt like Lewis Carroll had done well. And so I wasn't trying to do Lewis Carroll, like people write like Dr. Seuss style poems. I wasn't trying to do Lewis Carroll, but I did want it to feel like, like you were back in his world. So anyhow, um, I, I think from a theme standpoint that as an author, you don't, you don't intentionally go, well, I'm going to teach this lesson or I'm going to put this theme in my story. You just write the story that, that works for you. Um, and, and, and then people come back and say, hey, here are the themes that we found. And so some of the themes that people have talked about are looking at the world in a new way, which I think is so important. And I think all books make us do that. Self-acceptance, the importance of recognizing that our differences that a lot of times we want to hide, you know, we don't want to be judged or, or teased or whatever, like self-acceptance is so important in recognizing that those differences are what make us great. Uh, neurodiversity, um, logic versus imagination, empowerment, and then sort of the power of, of working together, right? Of, of being a team, which again, I, I feel like I feel like books should help us do that. Like books should let us see the world in a new way and encourage us to work together together to make our world better. So anyhow, with that in mind, um, we're gonna do a trivia contest. And 
I'm going to do 10 questions that go from easier to harder. And the reason that I wanted to do it this way is because I think I've got three groups of readers, okay? I've got people who are not familiar with Wonderland, you know, people who are like, yeah, I kind of know the story. I've heard the movie. I mean, I know there's kind of the Queen of Hearts and stuff, but I haven't really been into it. So for them, I just wanted to go straight in. Here is a cool fantasy story. And maybe when you get done, you'll want to go read Wonderland. Um, then there's a lot of people who have seen the movies and that's great. The movies are awesome. Like I, I, I love the original Disney movie. I love the Johnny Depp movie. So many great movies that were done. I love those. But one of the things about the movies is that they take two books. They take Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and they combine them in one story. So if you say to people, did you know that the Cheshire Cat and Tweedledee and Tweedledum aren't actually in the same world? They're like, wait, what? So that's kind of my movie people. So for them, they're gonna know, oh, I know the Duchess, I know the Queen of Hearts, I know the Cheshire Cat, um, but they'll see them in different ways. And then for people who really know and love Wonderland, like I've got a bunch of little Easter eggs, like it's literally like, like the deeper Easter eggs, you know, like you get done watching a Marvel movie and like you get certain things and, and maybe you get more because you're more of like a Marvel nerd. Um, and then like you come back and you watch like the YouTube videos where they're like, ooh, let's show you all the in-depth stuff that you missed. So that's kind of what I did for, for this book was like, like if you're really an Alice in Wonderland and a Lewis Carroll nerd, then you'll know stuff. So here is what we are going to do. We are going to have a trivia tea party. Um, and we have some fun stuff to give away. So one of the things that I've loved about Wonderland is just the cool imagery and the art and everything like that. And so what I did is I had a couple of custom art pieces created. And so what you see, you see the book on the right, on the left is our swag bag. And it's hard to see it all in detail. And I show it to you, but I don't even think you'd be able to see it as much um, on the camera either. Um, but basically what we've got is we've got the full size poster, okay, um, which I will sign. Then we've got the, um, that card you see on the left, that is like an oversized playing card. Um, and that is an ace of hearts with the Mad Hatter on it. That's done by Brandon Dorman, who did like Fable Haven, The Land of Stories, um, Goosebumps. He's done all those covers. He's just incredible. So he did that. And then the bigger one is a hard stock print um, of all the characters from the Lost Wonderland Diaries. So you've got Celia and Tyrus and the Queen of Hearts and, and the Hatter and Marianne, who's the creepy marionette, you know, and, and just all of those characters. And, and uh, those were done by Taylor Ma, who is an amazing artist who does um, kids video games and, and he's working on books and a lot of cool things. And then we'll have a bookmark and then a signed book plate that you can, it's a sticker that you can put inside. So what we're gonna do is this, we're gonna do 10 questions, easiest to hardest, you will answer in the comments. Um, if you don't get it right away, I'll give you a hint. If no one gets it, then we'll just answer it. Uh, but if you do get it right, then we're going to have Callie message you. We'll give you an email to contact Callie at Shadow Mountain. Let her know, hey, I'm the one who answered this. And we will send you that swag pack for free. Okay. And then stay till the end. Okay. Because we're going to do 10 questions, working our way up from easier to harder. But at the end, I'm going to tell you how you can win a swag pack if you didn't get one in the trivia contest and a book and uh, a $50 gift card. Okay, so we're gonna do that when we get done right at the very end, we'll tell you how to do that. Okay, so we're gonna jump into trivia. Um, we will watch for the questions here and then Kelly, we're gonna watch to see who, uh, who answers these first. So just type in your answers in the comments. Um, okay, so we're gonna work our way backwards because that feels very Lewis Carroll-ish. So trivia question number 10, okay? And these are all based on Lewis Carroll's book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. We're not doing through the looking glass. We're not doing through the movies. So these are based on that. But again, if you're kind of familiar with uh, with uh, the movies or the books, then hopefully you can get some of these. All right. So the first question, what does the Queen of Hearts constantly yell? If you know the answer, type that in right now. And the first person to type in the answer is going to win a swag pack. What does the Queen of Hearts yell all the time?
and this is from the movies and everything when she's angry, whenever anyone makes her angry. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. My, I think it's pronounced M-A-I, off with their heads. That's exactly right. Good job. Okay, Lexi, you were close there. All right. Yes, it is off with their heads. Okay, so my, um, we're going to tell you how to contact Kelly when we get done. You let her know, and we're going to send you a swag, signed swag pack. Okay. So we've got nine more questions. All right. There now the off with their heads are showing up. I don't know if we've got a delay there, but uh, but um, but just type them in quickly and then we will see them as soon as they come through. Okay, so uh trivia question nine. And again, if you've already answered this, we'll only have you win one swag pack. So if you've already answered one, then you can still type in the answer, but it'll be the first person who has not won one. And again, this is limited. This is limited to the US and Canada just because of mailing issues. So hopefully that's not a problem. Um, okay. What character greets Alice by saying, Who are you? Okay. Who is the character that uh that says, Who are you? when he first meets Alice? Okay, so just type it in the comments. I think we may be having a little delay. There we go. Okay. Connor the unicorn. All right. That is correct. You are right. It is the caterpillar. Now, one of the interesting things about the caterpillar is when I researched my book, I discovered that caterpillars don't have a gender until they pupate. Okay. So until they become a butterfly, you don't know if they're male or female. So when we meet the caterpillar in through the look or uh, the lost wonderland diaries, it's not exactly who you expect it to be. So that was kind of fun. All right. Okay. We're getting some good answers here. All right. So just in the comments, if you look and Callie's telling you how to email and let us know that you won. Okay. So trivia question number eight. Um, what does the queen of hearts use for croquet balls when she and Alice play? They use flamingos as their croquet mallets. What do they use for the croquet balls? All right, if you think you know, just type in the answer there. Spelling doesn't matter. I'm a terrible speller. Like I published 19 novels. I still have my editor fixing. Well, mostly my wife reads my stuff and goes, man, like you are so bad. Even the spell checker doesn't know how to fix your words. So don't worry about spelling. What does the queen of hearts use for croquet balls when she and Alice play? Um, oh, yep. Mason got it right. It is. That's right. It is hedgehogs. Yep. And that's really a terrible thing, right? Because hedgehogs are these cute little funny, like everyone, you see a hedgehog and you're like, I need to have a hedgehog that I like carry around in my pocket with me, right? Um, so it's terrible that they're hitting hedgehogs. But yes, it is hedgehogs. Okay. So Miles will get that set, or Mason will get that sent over there. Okay. All right. So we're going to get a little bit harder here now. Not terrible, but we are going to get harder. Now, feel free to Google, right? If there's not an answer coming up, some of these, when we get toward the end, they can get tough enough. Uh, you are allowed to Google as long as you get the answer first. Okay. So our next question, what does the Duchess's baby turn into after she hands it to Alice? Okay. <laughs> Lewis Carroll like just has some weird stuff in his stories, which is really fun. But yeah, after the Duchess gives her baby to Alice to take care of, and suddenly the baby turns into something a little bit unexpected. Although if you've had a baby that cries a lot, you know, and is young and annoying, then maybe you can sympathize a little bit. Charles Dodson didn't have any kids, so maybe that was his comment on, on young babies. What does the baby try? It does. Ooh, wow. <laughs> we had like three that came right up there. Okay, Moon Princess got it first. Jen and Ruby, you guys were like so close, but Moon Princess got it first. It is a pig. Yeah, the baby turns into a pig. Exactly. All right. So Moon Princess, you've won that one. Okay. All right. So we're going to bump it up a little bit. We're going to get a little bit harder here. Not terrible, but a little bit harder. Okay. So trivia question number six. What does the King of Hearts accuse the Knave of Hearts of stealing? Okay. Um, oh, not contest. It is contest. Um, Shadow Mountain, you're typing in contests. There's no S. It's just contest at jscottsavage.com. Okay, so the next question is, what does the knave of hearts accuse, the, or the king of hearts accuse the knave of hearts doing? They have a big trial, and, and Alice gets accused, and 
everyone's like running around and going, not me. And that's when the queen's shouting off with their heads. What does the king of hearts accuse the knave of hearts of stealing and put him on trial for? Okay. So type in the answer if you think you know. Ooh, there we go. Ruby, you got it. Yep. Okay. That's it. It's tarts. Exactly. Okay. So, yep. Type, uh, send in your email to contest at jscottsavage. Yep. It's the tarts. And um, sort of one of the fun things was we have this, this trial going on, right? Good job, queen tarts. That's right, Jen. You guys are good. You guys are on top of this. Um, but yeah, we have this trial. And in the mouse's tail, early in the book, the little poem that looks like a little tail, um, he talks about Fury trying to prosecute this mouse. And then we have the trial. And so in the Lost Wonderland Diaries, I had the mouse be a defense attorney who is coming to defend someone who's been accused by the queen of something. So, yep, it is the tarts. Good job. All right. So trivia five. Okay. We're getting a little bit tougher now here. Um, trivia five question. What is the name of the lizard Alice kicks out of the chimney of the white rabbit's house? So Alice gets sent to the white rabbit's house to get gloves and she eats something that turns her really big until she like can't get out. And they send the lizard down the, the chimney to kind of check on her and try to get her out. They've thrown like rocks and stuff at the windows and she kicks her foot and this lizard goes flying out of the chimney. And there's a really like famous line that they say, which is my wife's like favorite line from the movie and the books. Um, if we don't get it right away, I'll give you a hint on the line, but Bill, there we go. Okay, so Ruby, you've already won one. You got it first, but Jen, I think you have not won one. So Jen, you're gonna win a swag pack too there. Good job, yes. The line is, well, there goes Bill, which my wife just laughs about that all the time. So Bill the lizard is in, is in the Lost Wonderland Diaries too, but he's not quite the same lizard you remember. All right, so yep, Bill is the answer. Okay. So we are definitely gonna get tougher here. All right, we're getting harder questions here. Um, and again, like I said, if, if you don't get it, that's fine. If we don't have anyone new get it, then that's okay. We'll just have fun with this too. But I wanted to give people who really know Alice in Wonderland some trickier questions to ask. So congratulations to everybody who has won so far. Okay, so question four. How does the dodo suggest that Alice dry off after she nearly drowns in a lake of her own tears. She's really big, she cries, it makes an ocean. She falls in the ocean, she swims around and she's wet. And the dodo says they should have something. So be specific here of exactly what it is that he wants to have, which is sort of a political commentary uh, by Lewis Carroll. What does, uh, what does the dodo suggest they have um, to dry off? This is a harder one, so I'm not sure if we'll get any answers right away here. And like I said, if we don't, that is totally fine. We can just tell you. <laughs> I think, again, I think we've probably got a little delay here. So um, give you a little hint. Um, ooh, it is a race. That's right, May, it is a race. Do you know what kind of a race it is? This is a weird one. But yeah, they have a race where they run around and around in circles and there's no beginning and it's no ending to it. Anyone else? We've got May, uh, Ruby, I have a question. Um, uh, you should be from the US and Canada. Email Shadow Mountain, we'll see what we can work out. There you go, May, yes, yeah, it was a caucus race. Um, so Ruby, you're asking if you have to be, we'll do the US and Canada for sure. Depending on where you're at, it, as long as the mailing isn't super cost prohibitive, we will work it out. So. Normally we want it to be U.S. and Canada, but but Ruby, if you're not in the U.S., um, let us know. E email Shadow Mountain, and we'll figure something out with you. So we'll work something out. Yes, it is the caucus race. Good job. Okay. Um, so yeah. So uh, if you if you don't know what a caucus race is, um, here in the U.S., um, some of the uh, elections are set up the way they figure out who's going to represent each party is what's called a caucus race. And it's a really weird thing where like all these people get in rooms and they kind of talk to each other and they move around and they say, Mexico, I think we can probably mail that to Mexico, Ruby. Um, yeah, so we'll work it out. 
Yep. Um, so yeah, so a caucus race, it doesn't really have a beginning and it doesn't really end until they kind of decide, okay, yeah, we think this is it and it's over. And so having them run around and having a caucus race was, he's like, here's a race with no beginning, no end, no real rules. And then we figure out what the prizes are going to be, which was sort of fun. Um, okay, good job. All right. So trivia question three. What did the rabbit or who did the rabbit say he mustn't keep waiting? This is a trick question. Most people answer this question wrong. So when the rabbit says, I'm late, I'm late. And he's running around with that pocket watch and Alice is following him and he's trying to find his gloves and everything. Who is he afraid of keeping waiting? Who does he have a meeting with? Well, let's see what our answers are here. And this is fun again. I think for like all of us, Early on, we want to see the white rabbit because that's kind of, it's sort of synonymous with Alice in Wonderland, Alice and the white rabbit. Okay, Mason said the queen of hearts. That's the trick. In the movie, it appears to be the queen of hearts. That's not who it is in the book. Does anyone know? This is like I said, I told you we were gonna get tougher when we got toward the end here. The Duchess, there we go. Yep, Jen got it, that's right, yeah. It's the Duchess that he's actually afraid of keeping waiting, um, which takes us in an interesting part of the story. One of the things about Alice in Wonderland is with the exception of kind of the first and last chapters, you could move any of the chapters around and the story would kind of still work. Like it's really sort of episodic the way that it takes place. And so, yeah, the White Rabbit is is late for the Duchess, then he can't find his gloves. He sends Alice to go get them. He thinks she's Marianne. And so kind of turning this into a story was a lot of fun. Like what is the Duchess doing and why is she gonna play croquet with the queen and what's really happening with the white rabbit? So good job. All right, so, okay, now we're getting really tough, okay? These last two are, are pretty tough. Okay, the Cheshire cat tells Alice that in one direction lives a hatter and in the other direction lives who? Who lives in the other direction from the Hatter? This is when Alice first meets the Cheshire Cat and she's confused and, you know, he's telling her that they're all mad there. And uh, and he says, uh, she asks for directions and he says, where do you want to go? And he she says, I don't know. And he says, well, if you don't know where you're going to go, then, you know, you can go any direction to get there. So he tells her that in one direction lives the Hatter and in the other direction lives, any guesses? Interesting enough, after he says the Hatter lives in one direction and this person lives in the other direction, she actually meets those people together, okay? So a little hint, the next place she goes these two people, the Hatter and someone else are together. It's kind of the classic scene in Alice in Wonderland. Any guesses here? This is a tougher one. I knew you might have a, I knew you might have a little harder time with that. They are at the tea party. After she meets the Cheshire Cat, she goes to the tea party. And the Hatter is there, but he's not at the Hatter's house. Oop, there we go. The hair, exactly. Yep, okay. Those might be coming through on a little delay. They're just showing up for me. Ooh, yeah, the Wallers and the Carpenter. Ooh, that's a good one. Lexi, I like that. We hadn't had an answer for you, but that's a good one. The Wallers and the Carpenter are actually from, um, uh, they're not... They're not people that we meet. We hear the poem told about them afterwards, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, good one. Okay. Um, what name do I put in the two email address box? Um, so just put it, if you put it in contest at jscottsavage.com, and then you can either write it to Scott or Callie, and we will get that. So, um, okay, I think we're good here. Um, okay, Jen, I think you and Mason have each won one. If you haven't, then you you would. Um, but uh and then we need to get one for Lexi here too. So Lexi, if you don't get one yet, we're gonna have you like get in here and email us too. All right, so yeah, it is the March Hare. He says, in this direction is a Hatter, and in this direction is a March Hare, and they are both quite mad, which is how you get Mad Hatter from that. Okay, 
Final question, last question. And then, like I said, I'm gonna tell you how you can get swag and also have a chance to win the book and a $50 gift card, okay? All right, thank you, Lexi. Okay, so the final question. What song does the Hatter sing to Alice? Okay, this is a really weird one. The tea party is just so bizarre and I had so much fun writing my own tea party scene um, that it's just, it's just a kick, the Dormouse and the March Hare and the, and the Hatter. But the Hatter sings a song to Alice that he tells her that she performed. And it's a different version of a song that most of you are probably more familiar with. Um, I'll wait for a minute before I give you any hints. It is a classic children's song, kind of a bedtime song that he sings in a very different way. Yeah, I don't know how much delay we have from me seeing the comments to when, you know, basically you're typing them in YouTube, then they're coming through to the app here and they show up. So I think we probably get a little delay on this. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to give you a hint necessarily in, in, oh. unless any of you have it. Um, okay, I'm going to give you a little hint. So the tune that he sings it to is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Oh, yep. Twinkle, twinkle. Okay, Jamie. I'm going to, oh, hang on. Wait, Paige got it. Wow. That was actually a really close one. Actually, Paige and Jamie, you guys came through right on top of each other. So I will have both of you email uh, the email address and we'll get one to each of you. But yes, it is Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat. That's, that is the song that he sings, which is a little bit bizarre there. Um, interestingly enough, the unbirthday song, which you hear them sing in the original Disney movie, that's actually not until Through the Looking Glass. And the person who does the unbirthday thing is Humpty Dumpty, okay? So that was a different one. That's I'm actually just finishing up book two right now. Um, so yeah, so we've got you both there. Okay, so this has been a ton of fun. Um, we're going to do one more thing, and then I'm going to, um, who, let's see. Actually, let's see what time. We got a few minutes. You know what? Let's do questions first because the next thing that we're going to do, the 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 scavenger hunt, is probably going to take all of you like away, and I don't want to take you away right now. So let's do um, questions. Let's open it up for any questions you have or comments, any questions about uh, Alice in Wonderland, The Lost Wonderland Diaries, being an author. If you've got questions for Shadow Mountain, the publisher, writing, reading, anything that you want to ask, just type those in the questions right now. And again, um, I think we've got a little bit of a delay. Um, while I'm waiting for you to type in the questions, I'll tell you kind of a fun thing that a lot of people don't know about, about The Lost Wonderland Diaries. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do with The Lost Wonderland Diaries is we wanted it to... Um, sort of have a feel. Oh, um, good, good question. Okay, so, uh, oh, there we go, tons of questions. Okay, good, all right. So what made me wanna write middle grade? Um, I told you guys that I did not fit in when I was a kid. Um, I got picked on a lot, uh, I was shy, um, had a lot of things like the patch and speech therapy and different things, and so I didn't fit in very well. Um, and in fifth grade, I had a teacher, Mrs. Brizzoni, who started reading to us. And she read books that were kind of the classics at the time. Like, like, like when I say classic, not like, like ancient classic, but like the books that, that just, I still love and remember. And there was like where the red fern grows and a wrinkle in time and um, uh, the little prince um, and uh, Charlotte's web. And, and man, I just lived for those reading times when she would read to us. And then between seventh and eighth grade, our family moved. We lived in California at the time. We moved across the country to New Jersey. And I was very quiet already. And because I was different, I got kind of picked on a lot. I got eggs smashed on my head, rocks thrown at me. I got my bike stolen. And I ended up kind of cutting out of school a lot. And so um, uh, what I did was... Um, I looked for some place that was safe, right? Like it snowed a lot in New Jersey, it was colder. And I ended up going to the library 
And for me, like I tell librarians, they are like my superheroes. Like that's where I read about kids like me, kids who got picked on, kids who were different from me. I'd walk along these shelves and just realize there were all these worlds, right? And for me, like that, that literally saved my life. It was the place that I could go to and be safe. And, and I remember one day reading a book. I wish I remember what book it was, but I kind of looked up at all these shelves of books and I thought like, like how cool would it be if one day I wrote a story that other kids read in the same way that I'm reading these. So the first time I published a book, it was great. First time I did a book signing was great. But the first time I saw one of my books on the library with other books, it just gave me goosebumps. Um, so that's what made me want to write middle grade. Um, what we want to focus in Alice in Wonderland for this series. For me, it is just such a unique world. And in a lot of the spinoffs, it's like steampunk Alice or Alice on drugs, or this is a story of this specific character or whatever. For me, I just wanted to like see more of that world. Like, like if I had a dream that I could do, like going into whether it was like, like Hogwarts or whether it was like Wonderland or Oz or, you know, how cool would it be if you could actually go into one of those worlds and discover stuff that wasn't in the books. And so that's really what I was writing about then. So that's why Wonderland. I am writing a sequel. It's called uh, The War of the Queens and Celia and Tyrus, their mirror images get stolen by the evil fairy, the Bandersnatch. So um, different world, but you'll see some different characters. In fact, at the end of this book, when you get like to the very last page, you think you finished it, right? Kind of like when there's the credits in the movie and everyone gets up and leaves, but you stay because you know there's an Easter egg scene. If you go past the acknowledgments and the author question or discussion questions and the author notes, and there's even a blank page, flip past that page and there's a little Easter egg for book two. Um, my favorite adaptation of Alice in Wonderland or Carol's works in general. Um, I really, I love The Looking Glass Wars. I thought that was great as a YA. I was really intrigued by uh, Marissa Meyer's um, uh, Heartless, which is the story of how the Queen of Hearts comes about. Um, it's amazingly well written, and and she really obviously loved Wonderland, but uh, but it is the story of how this person you like becomes the evil Queen of Hearts. So I thought that was really good. Um, let's see. Um, oh, are more discover outliners. So what I do is I start with what I know. Like I have to write five chapters, 10 chapters. I have to like get into the story, know my characters and my world. And then I'm a very heavy outliner. I've got to come back and fit the pieces in to see where it goes. And so I always, for me, I have to start fresh, but then I have to know what my goal is, where I'm writing to. Um, so this is sold as a duology, um, but I'm hoping to do four books because there's four diaries. So I've signed a two book contract with my publisher and then I've outlined for them where I would like to see the books go. And I think there's some really fun things that we can do. Um, my favorite book that I've written for me is always um, the book that I'm writing. It's always the one that I'm most excited about. Oh, you like the shirt? Here, hang on, I'll show it to you. There's, so there's the front. This was sent to me by one of my friends and readers. And then if you look around, you can see the back of there. <laughs> so, yep, yep, I've got lots of Wonderland collections that I had before I ever started writing that. My favorite middle grade in any genre book. It's hard to not say Harry Potter. Like, like I just, I mean, that is, the characters in there, the world building are so incredible, but there's so many books that I love reading. Um, I always have just a ton of books. I mean, I'm reading uh, right now, uh, I'll just grab a couple of the books that I'm um, that I'm currently reading um, that are middle grade. I've got a lot of middle grade I'm not reading, but um, I just finished *The Elephant's Girl* uh, by Celesta Remington. Um, it is a, that was actually nominated for a Blue Bonnet Award in Texas, and that's about a girl who has a hurricane that blows her into a zoo when she's a baby, and she gets raised in the zoo and kind of can communicate with elephants. Um, the Book Wanderers, I'm actually reading that right now, loving that. That's amazing about uh, kids who can travel through books. Um, I had a chance to read an early copy of the graphic novel. This is a DC graphic novel by Dustin Hansen. My video game ate my homework. And it's sort of like um, uh, Stranger Things meets Dungeons and Dragons, right? Just super, super fun. Um, and then for the first time, I, I'm really late to the game but I'm reading um, Wings of Fire and just loving that. So 
Um, and then some of my favorite scenes try out oh, from my Far World books. Oh, thank you. Um, so Far World for me was really a discovery. I'd never written middle grade. I'd never written fantasy. Um, man, I just, I love when Marcus and Kaija first meet. I love him discovering his world, her discovering his, you know, Earth, him discovering Far World. And then just that connection where the two of them work together. Like for me, I think I think cooperation and teamwork and, and working together is just huge. So I, I, I love the scenes where Marcus and Kaija would work together. Okay, so we are about out of time. Let me tell you about our contest. Okay, so here is the deal. Um, we have a scavenger hunt, okay? And to play the scavenger hunt, you're going to go to www.yallright.com or not com, org, okay? That is wrong. It is yallright.org, O-R-G. So ignore that .com on there, okay? www.yallright.org. Somewhere hidden in one of their pages, it's not big, it's little, you got to look for it, is this picture of the white rabbit, okay? You're going to find that picture. You're going to email a screenshot to that same email we talked about, that contest at jscottsavage.com. Now, I believe this one is limited to the U.S. and Canada. Um, if you're not in the U.S., go ahead and mail anyway, and I'll let the publisher figure out. But I think because of what we're giving away, I think it has to be in the U.S. Um, so, or Canada. But you're going to go to yallright.org. You're going to find the little picture of the white rabbit. You're going to screenshot it. Email that screenshot to contest at jscottsavage.com. Everyone who emails, everyone who finds it, before midnight tonight, so midnight Utah time, okay? Midnight Mountain Standard Time. Everyone who screenshots it, if you haven't already gotten a swag pack, we will send you a swag pack. And to make it exciting, the first person to find it, the first person to screenshot that and email it, even if you already want something else, okay? We won't send you two swag packs, but we're gonna send you a swag pack plus a $50 gift card from Shadow Mountain, okay? So yeah, so that will be our contest. That's what we'll be doing there. Um, I think I got most of the question answered, yeah. Um, okay, so that is the contest. So again, just to repeat, um, you are going to go to yallright.org, not .com. You're gonna find this picture of the white rabbit. It'll look just like this, but much smaller. You're gonna send a screenshot to contest and the first person to send it in gets that. Everyone who sends it in um, before midnight, uh, today is November 9th. So before midnight tonight, mountain time, we're gonna send you a swag pack and the first person gets the, uh, gets the $50 gift card. So thank you everybody. This was wonderful. Thanks for having me, Shadow Mountain. Thank you for having me, Callie. Thanks for setting this up and hope you guys read the book and, and I hope you all just love Alice in Wonderland. And, and I hope that books, bring you happiness and comfort, you know, in this, in this stressful time. So thanks everybody.